Volcanoes are a force of nature. For millions of years, they have unleashed their indomitable power on our planet, threatening half a billion people across the globe. Facing this peril, a group of passionate men and women took on a mission to understand and to protect. Maurice and Katja Kraft, pioneers of modern volcanology, were among the first to cross the barrier of fire. So the cliche uh, of a volcanologist is not me. I would have a beard and a checky shirt and I'd be standing like this. The latest technological advances have transformed volcanology. Satellites, sensors and drones now accompany scientists on their missions. Today, amongst these airs, the passion remains intact. It was a very humbling experience to come out here and witness this firsthand. They relentlessly roam the volcanoes of the world, guided by their fascination for the giants of fire. There's definitely something sexy and exciting about being a volcanologist. In Tanzania, Olduanyo Dlengai dominates the rift valley from its 3,000 meter perch. For all volcanologists, it's already exciting to work on an active volcano. And for me, this is an even more exciting volcano in that it's the one on which I cut my teeth as a volcanologist. 10 years ago, young volcanologist Mathieu Kervin climbed to the top of Lengai for the first time. The vast crater was then filled by unique lava that whitens on contact with the air, forming a spectacular, immaculate landscape. Several months later, a huge eruption decapitated the summit and the volcano was transfigured. Since then, Mathieu Kervin has sworn to return to the top of the Tanzanian volcano to observe its transformation. The profession of volcanologist is not far removed from that of explorer. To reach this volcano at the end of the earth, Mathieu Kervin sets off on a grueling expedition. He hopes finally to achieve his dream to map the huge crater formed by the last eruption of Lengai. I sometimes think that being a scientist is like being a modern day explorer. And I became a volcanologist, which also has an element of going to extreme places or to unusual places, perhaps. The privilege of working on volcanoes is that it takes us to some fascinating places around the world. Uh, it means I've been able to visit and work in places I wouldn't otherwise have visited. Accompanied by a geologist and a local guide, Mathieu Kervin is determined to collect essential data on one of the world's least studied volcanoes because of its isolation. The Lengai is a very little studied volcano, in particular because there are almost no instruments on this volcano to record signals that could indicate future eruptions or tell us what is happening deep in the magmatic reservoirs. And on top of that, once you've reached the foot of this volcano, you still need to climb it, and it really is a very steep stratovolcano. Uh, the higher you climb, the more you're forced to continue on all fours, uh, on fairly unstable rocky slopes with rolling stones, which is also why very few scientists venture to the summit to observe its eruptions. Yeah. 
Before beginning the ascent of Langai, Mathieu Kervin must obtain the blessing of the Leibon, spiritual guide of the Maasai tribe who have lived for centuries at the foot of the giant. They are returning safe and sound. I know because a Laibon is never wrong, always right. These stones must be tied to you. You must lick them every morning on your way to the volcano and on the way back home. They will protect you. Lost in the immensity of the Rift Valley, this volcano is not for the faint-hearted. A difficult climb on an unstable slope of more than 45 degrees separates the intrepid volcanologist and his team from the summit. It's one of the steepest volcanoes I've ever climbed really is one where as you get uh, towards the top, you, you go two steps up and you slide down a step and you just try and keep going. Very much a multi-sensory experience. There's what you're looking at and the views below you, uh, both into the crater and uh, down the flanks, uh, but also the sounds of the volcano, the whooshes, and then of course the smell. The smell of sulfur and, and other gases assail your nose as the wind wafts the gases towards you. You might feel the vibrations of explosive eruptions through, through your feet. You might feel them in your chest. One of the great things about climbing a volcano, which I think you don't get necessarily if you're climbing any, any other mountain, is there's something that you can't see until you get to the top, which is inside the crater. And often you're overwhelmed by, by what you see in terms of the activity and, and the topography and so on, the landforms. Mathieu Kervin's efforts are finally rewarded. At his feet, the crater of Lengai is revealed in all its enormity. I get the impression that we're feeling tiny tremors directly on the surface. It's really magical to come back here after so long. Now the work can begin. Mathieu Kervin's mission is to map this huge depression using a drone. A rare opportunity to observe the mysterious lava of the Tanzanian giant. We can get really close, and we can really take a look in its mouth. We mustn't get too close, mind you. Ah, that's exceptional. This really is why we came. These are really projections, perhaps a small lava lake deep down with exploding bubbles, and we can see its surface. Volcanology can be quite a dangerous science if you're actually going to the volcano to study it. But we need to take that risk in order to understand the volcanoes so that we can try to ultimately preserve life. In Ecuador, atop the volcano Cotopaxi, 
there's the high altitude freezing cold that volcanologists like Silvana must face to carry out their mission. The altitude varies the pressure significantly, which directly affects our body. And the consequences can be quite unpleasant. Cotopaxi is topped with huge glaciers. In the event of an eruption, the melting ice could pose a mortal danger. Eruptions under ice can create a large volume of meltwater and that can suddenly burst out of the topography that confines it to form a kind of rapid flood of volcanic material. Um, most commonly, that melting occurs through localised pyroclastic flows that flow over the snow and ice cover and melt that and that mobilises the mixture of ash and water. To prevent this major risk, Silvana must regularly install sensors at the foot of the glaciers in extreme conditions at over 6,000 meters in altitude. She gets up at dawn and leaves her refuge to challenge the giant of ice and fire. Everything is frozen. It snowed a lot yesterday. It's all dry inside. There's no problem. Yes, that's good. We'll see what state the battery's in. That's not so bad. It's great. The battery works well at 13. Yes, it's just the snow that fell during the night. Yes, it fell during the night. So we'll quickly clean the panels and take the readings. Here on Cotopaxi, it's very important that we have stations to enable us to detect the lahars. We bury the sensors at 80 centimeters to one meter underground, depending on how easy it is to dig into the ground. It's not always easy, especially when there's permafrost. The phone battery is not working well in this cold. At this high altitude, oxygen is rare and the cold glacial. At any moment, altitude sickness threatens to render the volcanologists' efforts useless. Here, the Andean Cordillera is very high. It's difficult to work at altitude. We move less quickly. We think a little more slowly, too. And when you have altitude sickness, there can be unpleasant consequences, nausea, migraines, which complicates the situation. In that case, you must go down as soon as possible so your state doesn't worsen. To reach the volcano's inaccessible folds, Strength and endurance are sometimes insufficient. Then, volcanologists' missions can almost involve aerobatics. The summit of Ruapeo hides a lake with an acidic crater. 
Agnes Mazo regularly flies over the lake to take samples that enable her to measure the volcano's activity. The Ruapeo volcano is much observed because it can have lahas, mudslides, water with gas and rocks and ash. It's like a big mudslide that can hurtle down. That's why we keep a close eye on it. So for atomagmatic eruptions, one of the main dangers can be how unpredictable they are, because they're not just unpredictable because of the way that the magma is moving inside the volcano, but also in terms of whether or not it, it, it interacts with water. So um, for some eruptions, you can get very, very sudden eruptions because suddenly hot magma comes into contact with water and you get an explosion. On December 24, 1953, a mudslide from the Crater Lake swept away the railway bridge on the Auckland-Wellington line. Several minutes later, the express arrived at full speed and plunged into the river. 151 people lost their lives in the disaster. The sampling operation can begin, a sensitive maneuver which demands the greatest precision. This volcano is pretty hard to understand. It can have two types of eruption, one we can see coming weeks in advance, and another type for which there's no warning. You close it, and if there are bubbles, you have to fill it again. It gets very emotional. I have to come here to feel it, to understand what's happening. It's my passion, and I work on volcanoes. Lava is the holy grail for any volcanologist, the culmination of a life of adventure. It is the raw materials of volcanoes, the key to the great mystery. But reaching it is no easy task. Eric Storm has made it his quest. In Hawaii, in the vast deserts of cold lava flows, he defies the sharp rocks and the blazing sun to unearth an active lava flow. Lava is actually mesmerizing, and it's constantly changing. If you're watching a lava flow, particularly a basaltic lava flow, you can see it crusting over and then it bursts through and it changes and the, the colors change all the time. When we approach these lava flows, the first thing you feel is the radiant heat. With the molten lava being upwards of 1,100 degrees, you can feel that heat from several meters away. Obviously, the closer you get, the more intensified that heat becomes. There's a lot of gases involved, like sulfur dioxide and hydrogen sulfide, so you get that very pungent smell of the gases when you approach the flows as well. 
there's absolutely a risk taking samples of lava. Um, you know, we just don't know how fast the lava can move sometimes. And so, you know, being cautious and safe is the, the number one factor when it comes to sampling the lava. There can be lava tubes, which means that um, the crust is very thin and there can be very, very hot magma underneath traveling through the lava tunnel. So there is a risk that you could step through. It was a very humbling experience to come out here and witness this firsthand. And remember, we're talking over a thousand degrees. Well, when I first moved to Volcano Village, which is just a couple kilometers from the summit of the volcano, the volcano became my backyard, essentially, my living laboratory and my playground all at the same time. The feeling when we find a lava flow is it really indescribable. Um, it's very exciting. Um, it's very spiritual in many ways. Uh, it's, a, it's such a special place to be. For these explorers of the modern era, volcanologist isn't a job, it's a vocation, a proper love story. For these scientists, rationality sometimes gives way to fascination. Volcanologists have a real passion about the volcanoes they study. And I guess that can just be summed up by it's a love affair. We all are passionately in love with volcanoes and their natural beauty, but also their power. And they're just endlessly fascinating scientifically. This is one of the most active volcanoes in Europe, raised from the waves by successive eruptions. Stromboli frightens and fascinates with its impressive explosions. A true laboratory volcano, it is a reference for volcanologists the world over. Scientists of all stripes come to its crater to test their hypotheses. Since he started out, Francesco Sortino has always sworn by Stromboli. That's where he made his debut as a volcanologist and built his knowledge. The first time Francesco climbed to the slopes of Stromboli, it was love at first sight. It was a special story. It's as if I'd been called by the volcano, as if it had said quite clearly, come and work here, stay with me. When I arrived here, something in me changed. That's why I'm tied to this place, not just professionally, but also from an emotional point of view. Today, he has an almost carnal relationship with the living mountain. I think if you ask most volcanologists, they've always got their favorite volcano. It's quite interesting. I mean, we're scientists, we're rational scientists, we shouldn't have that. But you talk to most vol volcanologists and they will say, oh, my favorite volcano is X. And the reason for it being X is because when they went there, it was doing something. It was erupting, it was doing something spectacular. And they fell in love with it there and then. The last eruption, the last lava flow we had on Stromboli, 
was in August 2014. Before, there had been a very high level of explosive activity of a strength I'd never seen. There were explosions you'd feel in your heart. They'd almost make your heart explode. It's clear that the days of Harun Tazieff are over. And even if the technology of Tazieff's time has moved on a great deal, so it's a little romantic to think you can just go measuring, taking readings directly in the crater. I can't imagine being permanently at my desk, directing measurement from a computer. I need to come here and feel the volcano, to touch it, to look at it, to do something in the field, because that gives me much more of a chance of understanding than by sitting behind a computer. Fieldwork is the bread and butter of volcanology, so it's what kind of keeps the lifeblood of volcanology going. Because there's nothing really that compares. You can read um, volumes of papers about a volcano, but the first time you go out there and actually see the situation for yourself, it really changes your perception about how the volcano is working. Ciao, Jacopo. Ciao. Che state facendo qui? Often you have a, uh, you can have quite a large team of people who, all of whom have different scientific goals on the same expedition. And I've had some really, really successful field campaigns with the INGV in Italy on volcanoes like Etna and Stromboli. We have several cameras, from high-def cameras to high-speed cameras, cameras that record thermal infrared. Well, that makes it possible to see very different aspects. The speed at which clastic rocks emerge, the position of the eruptive mouths, the gas escaping from these mouths. The overall aim is to study the volcano's explosive activity. <laughs> For other groups, it's also an opportunity to test new instruments. For example, the balloons are something new, something we've never tried. Stromboli is a laboratory volcano. I think I've done a fair bit for that laboratory. My work as a volcanologist has always been bound up with my life. Everything I've done, I've done to give meaning to my work, but also to myself. More than 10,000 kilometers in distance, another enthusiast is making her childhood dream come true at the summit of a volcano. Piton de la Fournaise looks down on Réunion Island from atop its 2,600 meters. With every eruption, the volcano gains ground on the sea. Layer after layer, the volcanic island grows, spreading its black rock into the ocean. <laughs> Aline Pelletier knows Piton de la Fournaise like the back of her hand. Just 35 years old, she is the first woman to hold the position of director of Reunion's Volcanicological Observatory. At each eruption, she ignores the danger and rushes to the lava to collect valuable samples. <laughs> Let's go. Let's go. 
Allez, on recule. Attention, derrière. Voilà, on va se reculer un peu. Ah, attention Là, on a une belle échantillon. I think often the relationship with, with volcanoes begins in childhood, but I think it's um, like all kids, you know, they're, they're fascinated by dinosaurs and, and volcanoes, and, and most of them pass through that stage and become interested in other things. Uh, but for those who, who, you know, it really captures the imagination, I think that will often stay with people. In a calm period, Aline Pelletier visits the Piton's rugged slopes every day to take its parts. Aline grew up with this volcano. She too caught the bug at a very early age. I found my vocation very early on a trip to Italy to the Stromboli volcano when I was in high school and was treated to the site of an erupting volcano. I was fascinated by the beauty of the spectacle. From that moment, I wanted to become a volcanologist. I've got the results of last week. We've got three times more. The Enclos Fouquet is an immense caldera formed following the collapse of the volcano upon itself. At the bottom of this depression, 300 meters deep and three kilometers across, volcanic activity has resumed. Each day, the landscape is transformed as the volcanologists look on. A small crater from 2015 with the fault that opened here. The last significant eruptions, I'm thinking mainly of the one in April 2007, which is really the eruption the team at the observatory call historic, as never since man's arrival on the island had anyone seen an eruption with as much lava. There was 200 million cubic meters of surface lava, which is 10 times that of a classic eruption. Fountains of lava 200 meters high, whereas an average eruption will reach nearer 20 meters. And the formation of a caldera at the crater's summit. That means that the crater, in two days, collapsed to a depth of 300 meters over a diameter of around one kilometer. You could put the Eiffel Tower in there. It really was the first time that had been seen at the Piton de la Fournaise since man came to the island. Aline Pelletier puts her unparalleled knowledge of the Piton at the service of protecting the population. We really work for the population, not just for research. It really is a forensic investigation. We try to understand what's happening. We try to warn the population in time, and that's the exciting aspect of the volcanologist's work at the observatory. Many young children just really feel that connection to volcanoes and the power that they have. And uh, sometimes that turns into a bit more of a scientific interest as well. Like all the volcanologists of her generation, Aline Pelletier was inspired by a legendary couple of adventurers. Nicknamed the Volcano Devils, Maurice and Katia Kraft were among the first to brave the volcanic dangers close to the lava flows. In a 25-year career, they witnessed more than 175 eruptions and constantly communicated their passion to the public. Thanks to them, our knowledge of volcanoes has taken a giant leap. But on June 3rd, 1991, the risk associated with their passion caught up with them. A pyroclastic flow from the Japanese volcano Unzen took these indefatigable chroniclers of the Earth's anger.
the craft airs are today inhabited by the same passion. Scientific progress has now provided them with new tools for studying volcanoes while minimizing the risks. We have to use clues from uh, a wide range of different sources to piece together a picture uh, of what is happening deep inside the Earth's crust. You have to know physics. You are also a chemist. Probably the most important part is, is the human imagination, trying to imagine what is that volcano doing down there. So if you want to understand why the volcano is erupting, you have to understand a little bit of a lot of different sciences. For more than 30 years, Ari Trosti Gudmundsson has crisscrossed the Icelandic volcanoes. Today, he is returning to one of them, the one most scrutinized by scientists. Located to the southwest of the island, the archipelago of the Vestman Islands is composed of 14 islands that are gradually emerging from the sea as a product of underwater eruptions. The youngest of them, the island of Sertsi, emerged just 50 years ago. volcano erupts in the sea, the first thing that might happen as the lava meets the seawater is to have very violent explosions because the, the, the water boils and the steam expands. And this can be a very violent process uh, with rather dramatic sprays of rock and steam and water into the air. These young volcanic lands are fragile. As soon as it appeared, the island of Sertsi was sanctuarized in order to preserve it from any human intervention. Very few scientists are authorized to set foot on this new land for fear of disturbing its ecosystem. Ari Trosti Gudmundsson has this huge privilege. Since the island was born, he has been witness to its perpetual transformation. In 1964, I was 14 years old. I was lucky enough because I knew people in the aviation business. I was able to fly uh, uh, more than once uh, all over the island while it was erupting directly from the sea with the black columns, later on with the lava. That was the, uh, the greatest moment to step the first time onto yeah. the island. And this would be uh, 1971. And that's after the uh, uh, eruption stopped, but uh, this was smoking. And uh, uh, we found some uh, spots that were too hot to, uh, to touch. I write poetry, uh, a somewhat poetic uh, connection to both the science and to a place like, like uh, Sutsen. The volcanologist knows that the little island's days are numbered. Eroded by wind and water, Sertsi is surely destined to disappear. The island started to change shape very slowly as a consequence of the uh, erosion by the oceans, the waves, and through wind and rain. So Sertse offered a dramatic opportunity for people to study the recovery or the establishment of an ecosystem fresh after an eruption. Being a, a ge geologist, you are, of course, uh, uh, 
in some, some way a historian. And to be here is, of course, a somewhat emotional thing because you are in very close contact with uh, the origin of not, not only the, the, the Earth, but your, yourself. We come from the elements that are here, and they are coming from supernovas and whatever, somewhere in the world. In studying volcanoes, one of the biggest challenges we have is the fact that uh, a lot of material uh, and a lot of things that happen, happen unseen underground. And also in the huge phase of an eruption, a lot of what is going on is obscured. Interpreting the rocks from a volcano is exactly like reading them. These researchers read the living mountains like an open book. Each geological layer is a page to decipher. For over 50 years, Pierre Boivin has covered every inch of the Auvergne volcanoes. He has devoted his life to studying volcanism in the Auvergne and the many mysteries still to be revealed. This knowledge enables him to revive sleeping giants. Flying over the chain of Fouy, Pierre Boivin reconstructs the formation of this incredible alignment of volcanoes. When you see these volcanoes and these forms so fresh, so suggestive, one can easily imagine their eruption. The cones are topped with a crown of fire with bombs piling up all around. The definition of extinct volcanoes is that they are more than 10,000 years old. So if they're less than 10,000 years old, they're just asleep. But it is under the ground, at a depth of more than 25 meters, that volcanoes deliver their best kept secrets. Safely harnessed, Pierre Boivin sinks into the Auvergne basement. Le Creux de Soucy is an immense underground cavity formed by the passage of lava flow. Its walls feature the entire volcanic history of the region. Understanding volcanoes is a little bit like detective work, where what we have to do is take the pieces of information that we can access and use that to kind of recreate what we think happened. So it's very much a process of deduction, uh, understanding past eruptions in volcanology. At this spot, there is a remnant of ancient soil which keep a trace in the form of small pieces of wood that allows us to date it to around 9,300 years ago. So man was already here and witnessed the eruption. We can see gray layers, clear layers, which are the deposits of a volcano that has erupted very violently. And there, this isn't aerial fallout. It really was a blast that destroyed everything in its path. And if there was a floor, everything was flattened and there was no trace of it. And from time to time, there were bombs tossed into the air which came and got stuck in these deposits that were being left on the ground. For a geologist, it's like finding a treasure chest. You just have to look and sample carefully. A summary in the form of layers of rock, the whole local history. All the researchers tell us that our factory that makes magma still works. On the other hand, the time scales are such that we are not able to say when something will come out. We cannot predict the future at all. 
Many volcanologists, the, the primary concern might be to understand the volcano, but the reason they're doing that is because they want to protect people. They want to protect the villagers, the people who live there. In hot spots the world over, volcanologists probe the bowels of volcanoes to anticipate eruptions and sound the alert. We really need a combination of fundamental scientific research to understand the, the nuts and the bolts of how the volcanoes are working. But without, the, without thinking about how to communicate or without effective communication with the local populations, then, then that is pointless. You need to have both. In Ecuador, the 5,000-meter-high Tungurahua dominates the Banos region. Here, scientists rely on the empirical knowledge of local populations, who for generations have been living at the foot of these giants of fire and have learned to interpret the warning signs of an eruption. Jorge is a young farmer who has lived all his life at the foot of Tungurahua. He has felt the lash of the volcano's anger. Today, he has decided to put his experience at the service of his community by becoming one of the Tungurahua watchers. In collaboration with the Volcanological Observatory, Jorge daily monitors volcano activity on the lookout for the slightest resurgence of activity. We must be present at any time of the day, round the clock, seven days a week, 365 days a year. We must be attentive, radio always hooked to your belt. You must be in permanent contact with the Institute to warn them if necessary and to receive information. So there's some really great examples from around the world, the way that communities come together to, to live with the hazards. So for example, around Tungara Volcano in Ecuador, they have a system of volcano watchers who then share information and, uh, and, and also share information with the um, volcano observatory, but then also with the local communities. So Tungarawa is a fascinating volcano. As a scientist, um, it's a very deadly volcano as well. It's a, it's a huge, volcanic mountain in Ecuador, and it uh, burst back to life in 1999 with, some, with quite a dramatic increase in activity. All the southern part for the Andes was dark. Nothing could be seen. It was like a storm as we approached, with lightning flashing. All this part of the sky, it was just like a storm. We were scared. We took some pan lids and blankets and covered our heads with them because it was raining stones. They made a noise, puff, on the ground. And the ground caught fire like the embers in a barbecue. The stones were huge, so people were crying, shouting, running in circles. They didn't know whether to run or stay where they were. It was hell. All these events, we faced them and we survived. And now we can tell others, future generations, so that they can prepare for and deal better with situations of this kind. Good evening. You're informed that activity is slow, production is zero. As expected, it rained today until about 2 a.m. Supported by volcanologists, the population has decided to take its destiny in hand. Jorge reports to the Volcanological Observatory every evening to share his observations. 
One of the things that happened there that was uh, and a great response was the local observatory and also the people managing the risk decided to start involving the communities in the watching of the volcanic activity. And, and that is a remarkable uh, way that people have actually taken it upon themselves to manage the volcano that they live near. You are informed that there is a layer of snow from 600 metres below the level of the crater. That's all the information I can give you. Remain in contact. Have a great night. Thank you. Good night. That's really empowering. You know, the notion that it's not just left to these expert scientists, that communities themselves can look after themselves. I think that's a really important aspect. Despite the immense progress achieved, volcanology is still in its infancy. Nothing, however, could divert these guardians of the volcano from their mission to understand and protect. This huge task falls to a new generation of volcanologists. hoping that I can pass some of that passion on about volcanoes and understanding their hazards and um, help the next generation of volcanologists come along.